10 microns, whereas focusing laser, this is focusing a laser to a few hundred nanometers, which is tough. So now we're in the regime where we've really got you know, a strong absorber for single photons, which allows us to do single photon absorption and single photon processing with these superatom blocks. All right, so how did we get to there? So, uh, so this goes back a long way, and I'm just going to mention um, some of the experiments that we did. So we started doing uh, Rydberg EIT in 2006, and actually I was saying to Frederick, I was actually inspired by Frederick's um, lecture that he gave in 2004 in, the, in a conference in Rennes, when I saw his curve of the, the argon spectrum and how big the interactions were, how he had to go to a density of 10 to the 3 per cubic centimeter to avoid all these broad lines. And I thought, gosh, if they're that big, I'm sure I can do something useful with that. So it was 2004 when I made the decision to start Rydberg physics, and 2006 when we got our first result. And I always wanted to do something optical. I always wanted to do something in the optical, because I'm basically a sort of optical physicist, so I have been historically. So I wanted to do something optics with Rydbergs. So we started doing Rydberg EIT, 2006, and, and then we started to look for these nonlinearities, and it proved more difficult. We had to solve some problems. I mean, one of the big tricks is the use of these S states. So when we started, it wasn't realized how important it was to use these repulsive interactions and, and S states that are spherically symmetric. And we did a lot of work on D states, and we saw a lot of ionization and a lot of bad things that, that all, all the people that have been in Rydberg field for a long time spent a lot of, lot of time studying and building that, like, uh, building the, the sort of information that you need to do the nice stuff. And so you need to know what region of the phase space to look in to get, to get the nice physics out. So it was about 2010 when we saw these giant optical nonlinearities, and this is similar to the curve that Misha showed, where you see a suppression of the EIT because only, only one photon can go through at a period of time. <coughs> and then 2012 was when the sort of the, the quantum optics started, and as Misha said, it's point number five to demonstrate you've got photon photon interactions, you need to measure photon correlations. So you need to count photons and, and measure this G2 function. And then the thing I've just told you about is this nice physics with phase transitions, which is a sort of different direction. Um, but again, it's a kind of optical physics. And I think one of the things we want to study here, I mentioned the, these colors here are actually li linked to this super radiant cascade. So we want to study super radiance is a topic that hasn't been discussed that much in the conference. It's actually very hard to do super radiance experiments because of all, all, all you get basically complicated situations with with uh, transitions going to all sorts of different levels and things like that, and it's hard to extract really good quantitative information, but we're going to try and look at this system and understand that in, in more detail. Now, in terms of the nonlinear optics with Rydbergs, on the classical nonlinear optics, if you're interested in reading a sort of review that gives a nice sort of a um, physical picture of how this nonlinearity arises, then we wrote this paper that appeared in Andrew Rio called Atoms and Molecules, which you probably won't be able to find. So I recommend just going and getting the archive version of it. Um, it's quite hard to get hold of this. Um, but we didn't know that when, when they asked us to write a paper for them. It would be so, so difficult. Anyway, so that's sort of... And then, as we've seen in the last two years, there's been this emergence of this sort of new field now, Rydberg quantum optics, where you're really doing single photon thing, and there's a number of groups involved now. So the Georgia Tech group making a single photon source, um, the Harvard-MIT collaboration that we heard about from Misha, and there's a nice poster, um, then our group, and then also Garhing now, and there's the nice poster from Daniel, um, where they've got nice results on single photon switching. So, and I think there's many other groups actually getting involved in this topic, and I think it is a a very exciting topic, and there's lots of different directions you can go, as Misha pointed out at the end of his lecture yesterday. Okay, so one direction might be that you want to sort of, um, and it's the direction that I hinted at in my first lecture, is that we want to sort of replace what these linear optics quantum computer people, well, I'm going to say, um, you know, what they, what they struggle to do because they don't have any deterministic operations, so that the way their system scales is very inconvenient. If we can add some determinism to their system, then the scaling becomes more favorable and we may be able to build small processes that don't require sort of a, a billion sort of photon channels and, and so on, a billion photon detectors. So, so what we can have now is that we can think about at least deterministic processing. So we've got deterministic sources from Rydbergs, um, we don't quite know how good they are yet, but they needed to be tested. We can 
in principle, de to deterministic photon processing, and detectors is the relatively easy part because we know how to make single photon counters already, <coughs> at least with some efficiency. Um, but there might be some interesting things we can also do on the detection side, also exploiting the Rydberg atoms to sort of amplify. In a sense, the single photon switch work that you're doing is a kind of amplifier, and you can get more, more efficient detection um, from, from this kind of uh, ideas that we're developing in the Rydberg field. All right, so, so how would this processing work? So the processing is the hard, really hard bit of, of how, what are we going to do here. And we sort of heard a bit about this um, from Misha about how you can get phase shifts. So I want to talk a bit about a phase shift. So if we want to make something like a photon gate, we want two photons in and we want two photons out. We don't want to lose any photons. So losing photons would be bad. That wouldn't be a quantum gate. It's like Mark Safman losing an atom while he's trying to do his CNOT is not good, and it doesn't give us a fidelity, a very good fidelity. So we want two photons in, two photons out, and we'd like the phase shift. So this would be a controlled phase in, in, um, compute, um, in quantum information language, and we want to say a pi phase shift, ideally. So that the, um... <coughs> Now there's something else here, that photons, are sort of, photons have many degrees of freedom. So although they're nice and we can send them across the room, one to the other, they can change in many different ways. So they have a three-dimensional wave packet, um, and, they have also, and they have all this frequency spectrum, so they have this kind of mode, if you like, so we call it a mode. But when we do this phase shift, we want to change one thing and only one thing, which is the phase, but we want to preserve everything else about the mode of the photon. Because if we change the mode, then when we try to interfere a, a photon like this with another photon, if it's changed the mode, the interference will no longer be 100% efficient. So we'll no, no longer get good uh, contrast when we do interferometry with these photons. So we have to preserve the mode of the photon, and that's the really hard thing to do with photon processing. So if we think about how this might work, so if we think about nonlinear optics, so the classic, classic idea in nonlinear optics is I have a, an optical Kerr effect. So we talked about this polarization, and linear optics means the dipoles that I induce are linearly proportional to the electric field, so I could produce a polarization that's linearly proportional to the electric field. That's linear optics. And then when, if I have nonlinear optics, then I get this anharmonic response that we talked about, and that starts to create new frequencies like second harmonic generation or third harmonic generation and things like that. So in crystals, I can get a chi-2. With atoms, I, get a chi, I only get a chi-3 because of the up-down symmetry. It doesn't care whether the electric field's up or down. So I've got this nonlinear response that comes from the anharmonic response of my oscillating charge in a classical picture now, and that's the optical Kerr effect. And this nonlinearity gives me a phase shift. So, so because now the dipoles, the size of the dipole depends on the size of the applied field, and the, then I add this dipolar field to my original field, and that determines the phase of the propagating wave, I have a refractive index that depends on the applied field. So as I change the field, refractive index changes, and that's nonlinear optics. And so, so I get a phase shift now that's proportional to the electric field squared, and it's proportional to this chi free and the length of the medium. And this is the electric field of my photon that Misha told us how to calculate. So this is a small field. Turns out it, typical parameters like a one uh, megahertz uh, bandwidth and uh, one micron focus, this is about 10 volts per meter, something like that. So it's a, it's a sizable field, actually, but it's small. And these chi frees are typically very small. So Matthias said, showed us a nice plot that's in our review article uh, about how big these chi frees are. And it's only since we got um, started to do this Rydberg uh, nonlinear optics that we've reached chi frees where we can get this to be large enough that one photon can make a pi phase shift. So that's the big, big change. But even though we've got these nice Rydberg media now with enormous nonlinearities, giant optical Kerr nonlinearities, if we like, it's still not, it still might not work. So, in fact, you can read papers that tell you it's not going to work. So, Shapiro, who's a very clever guy at MIT, says single photon Kerr nonlinearities do not help quantum computation. Um, Julio Giovanna Cloche, impossibility of large phase shifts by a giant Kerr effect with single photon wave packets. So there's lots of people say, oh, it's a waste of time doing nonlinear optics not for quantum computation. And the reason is, is because this change of the mode of the wave packet. So here we see that the phase that I imprint on my photon depends on the electric field. So where the electric field is large, I'm going to get a big phase shift. And I've tried to draw this 
badly here, I think. So, so where the electric field is large in the middle of my photon wave packet, I shift a lot. And so I'm going to get this bunching of all that. So actually, it you can see how it introduces different frequency components when I squash bits of my photon in different ways. And so this phase shift is going to be spatially dependent. And in fact, if there's also some spatial dependence, because one photon's here and the interaction is spatially dependent, if it's 1 over r cubed, that will also give phase shifts that are spatially independent. So basically, you end up with a kind of a mess. So you can actually get a phase shift, so you'll get some mean net phase shift, but the fidelity of a gate will be very poor because the modes will no longer match. So the photons you come out with aren't the same mode, in the same mode as the photons you went in with. So this is a big problem if we want to think about doing photon processing, even though now we've got these large nonlinear, uh, these giant optical nonlinearities at the single photon level. So I just want to give you some ideas about how we could think about <coughs> solving these problems. And it kind of brings together everything we've heard at the meeting. So I think it's, I'm quite glad that I get to speak right towards the end here, because we can start to explore, we can start to um, use some of the stuff that other people have told you to think about how we're going to solve this problem of, of phase shifts being spatially dependent and intensity dependent if we want to just impose a nice global phase on a photon from another photon. So the first thing is that we know this blockade interaction can be spatially independent. So when we're in, within a block, it's like an on-off thing. So if I put two things inside a blockade sphere, then I turn off the interaction completely. So I have an interaction, the interact, and that's what we saw in a lot of talks. So we saw it nicely in Thomas Paul's talk, and we saw it again in Tillman's talk yesterday. And this is essentially the dressing potential that Thomas Paul talked about and Tillman talked about. And you see it's spatially dependent, so this is a bit basically the 1 over r to the 6, or the 1 over r cubed, depending on if, if, um, what kind of interactions we've got. But then once we get within the blockade sphere, it's basically it's finished now. I can't put any more stuff in there, so it goes flat. So as long as I'm within, well within a blockade sphere, I can get a spatially independent interaction. And that's going to be good for imposing phase on, um, phase on, phases on a photon, because as long as the photons are within the blockade sphere, the phase shift is going to be independent of their separation. Uh, so that's the first feature that we're going to... So we're going to exploit the spatial independence of the blockade interaction to imply global phase shifts on light. And then we go back to Mark's talk, who told us how to make gates. So, so this is how... And we can use blockade to turn on and off operations. So we can make additional <coughs> operations depending on so I can have a, a control and a target, and depending on where my control is, I decide whether the target does some kind of unitary operation. So, so I do like a 2 pi pulse, and that gives me a minus 1 on the target. But if my control is up here, then it's, it goes to the Rydberg state, and that blockades this transition, shifts this guy off resonance, and then I don't do the 2 pi pulse, so I don't get the minus 1. And this is basically the original proposal that stimulated a lot of activity on this quantum information using Rydbergs from, from Yaps in 2000. So maybe we can do the same with photons. We can, we can now do exactly the same operation on photons. And uh, this picture's from, from Mark's review, and um, I guess it's also the same picture in his talk. So we've got two good things now. We've got spatially independence, <coughs> and we've got a way of doing gates, basically. Um, so all we have to do now is convert our photons into excitations that were within a blockade sphere, <coughs> then do this gate pro protocol, and it should be spatially independent. We get pi phase shifts. We've got a nice C phase operation on our photons. Good. Right. And then we use another bit of stuff that Misha taught, um, taught us a bit about, which is this sort of polariton idea and the slow light. So, so we said so if we have EIT, so when we do this excitation of Rydbergs, we use this two-step <coughs> excitation, and you get EIT. And EIT gives us this steep dispersion. dispersion. So here's the EIT resonance, here's the, the real part, I get this steep dispersion, and I get a group index that depends on this mixing angle. And this group index can, can be very, very large. And in fact, if I reduce the intensity of my coupling laser, it can go to infinity. And that's the idea of stopping light. So Misha didn't talk about this, but if you look at his um, paper from, uh, again, 2000. Gosh, he did a lot of stuff in 2000, didn't he? So he did uh, dark state polaritons in EIT in, in uh, 2000. So this is the idea that I can come in with some pulse of light 
And then if I turn off the coupling laser, I change this mixing angle, and I convert all the light into an excitation in my medium. So when I'm down here, I'm all excited. So this is the pulse coming in. This is a, so that's the electric field. Here's the electric field pulse. I turn off the coupling laser. The electric field's gone. Where's it gone? It's gone into excitation. So this is essentially population or coherence. So it's uh, the, the coherence actually, but it's also population in the Rydberg state or superposition of ground and Rydberg state. So all my electric field has now become an excitation in the medium, and it's, it will stay in the medium until I turn back this field back on. So I can actually store the light in the medium for as long as I want, and then I can release it when I turn this coupling laser back on. And if you plot out the whole wave function of this polariton, you see that it's just the same thing, and you just see the slow light effect. So when this angle changes, this is like a space-time diagram, and you see that, that, that this is sort of a... So this is the group, um, slow group velocity, and you can actually make this zero if I turn off the field completely. You can change this mixing angle to infinity. So we can do light storage, and people are using this in these quantum memories. So people can store light pulses, and now you can store them for very long times, you know, minutes and stuff, and as, as long as the dephasing of your system, as long as there's no dephasing of the spin wave. So in order to retrieve this stored wave, we need all these phases to preserve. So it's very important things don't move around, and the, the atoms don't decay, and so, so it's going to be dependent on the <coughs> lifetime of the Rydberg state, but also the, actually the critical thing, more than the lifetime of the Rydberg state, is the motion. So, so we don't cool things to absolute zero, there's still some thermal motion, and that gives us some phases here, and that means when we try to retrieve this stored photon, that these phases are a little bit messed up. And, and again, the photon we get out is not quite the same one, and it comes at a slightly different direction uh, to the one that we sent in. So that's bad. So, so we have some um, dephasing time or, or decoherence time for this stored wave, but this can be reasonably long um, in these systems. And I just want to show you how well we can do, and I think this is currently the world record for storing light and retrieving light. So the question is, how efficiently can we do that? So this is an experiment that's done by ITU in, in, tai, in Taiwan. And the, this is their incoming pulse. So that's got intensity of 100% or, or 1, yeah. And then they, they turn off this coupling laser and it disappears. So it's become a spin wave in the medium now. They do, they do their storage in the ground state, not in a Rydberg state, but it's, so it's a lambda system rather than a ladder system, but it's the same physics, essentially. So now that it's stored in the medium, and then they sort of wait, and they can wait as long as they want, and then they say, right, I want it to come out now, this stored light, and uh, they turn it back on, and there's the pulse coming out. So it looks similar to the one you put in. So this is the pulse that went in, here's the pulse that comes out, and it looks very similar, and it's slightly smaller. And it's about 80%. So that's currently sort of state of the art that I can store and retrieve pulses with 80% efficiency. So that's not bad, it's not 99%, but you know, it's, it's a starting point. And certainly it would help these linear optics people if they could do some kind of photon processing at the 80% level even. That's a significant uh, advance on what they can currently do. So we can, um, currently people can store and retrieve um, light pulses or single photon pulses with 80% efficiency in cold gases. <coughs> All right, so this is how our system uh, might look in terms of uh, there's various ways we can think about making this photonic phase gate that we want to make. But this is sort of one scheme that you can think of doing. You can use, think of using pol polarization encoding for the qubits. So the idea is you have basically uh, uh, two channels. So we have a control channel, so photons come in here, and a target channel, and the other photon would come in here. And then the qubit can be polarization, so depending on where it's... So our zero and ones are horizontal and vertical polarizations, and then we can use beam splitters to split up this and make interferometers, and, eventually, and essentially that's what Mark was telling us, that if we want to make a gate, it's essentially a conditional interferometer. So we make an interferometer where we have the phase in that from interferometer is conditional on the state of this control guy. So if the control guy is in state 1, he goes down this path, he goes into our atomic medium, he creates a Rydberg excitation, that Rydberg excitation creates a blockade, and that prevents some Rydberg excitation here on this guy, and that's going to change the phase of this guy, so this 1-1 one, one state doesn't get this extra minus 1 here, so we get this conditional phase operation um, based on this idea, this sort of arrangement.
of these interferometers. So that's roughly the idea. Uh, yeah. So you store <coughs> um, a single photon, basically a single polarization qubit, in the in the cloud. But then there's the other polarization, yeah. which travels uh, not through the cloud. Yeah. So the stored one gets a delay. Yeah. So I, actually, there is. Uh, let me just see if uh, I'm going ahead. Right. The real scheme is here at the end. So it's actually we send all four, all channels through the cloud. Mm. Actually, yeah. but yeah. So just it's true. You, you could you could either send it through a fiber, or you can also put yeah. it through the medium. But it's that's a problem. Yeah. So there's a delay of one foot, and then you've got to match up these two bits of the photon wave packet again at the end. Yeah, but it's a good point. Okay, so this is sort of the scheme that we want to use, and then, now we've got the problem here. So there, there's still a problem in a sense that when these photons go into the medium, if they're exciting, creating these Rydberg spin waves or Rydberg polaritons, they're already interacting. And we said that's going to be bad because they, you know, the, the edges of these, uh, so we've got these sort of long, edge, long tails of these photon pulses and they come into the medium and if we think of this sort of dressing idea then we're in the far field currently at that point we're in the far field and we've got this spatially dependent interaction that's going to screw up the phase of our photons so we, so we only want the interaction to really appear when we're into the blockade sphere so we kind of want to get it into a blockade sphere and turn on the interaction and do it in a much more controlled way so we can get a nice global phase shift and that's the tricky bit because how can we get two guys into a blockade sphere without them interacting? We know that's... So what we, what we... Our scheme is to make use of these resonant dipole-dipole interactions and the combination of, of the non-resonant ones with the resonant ones. So actually we, what we're going to do is send in photons that don't interact <coughs> and then induce an interaction via a longer range resonant dipole-dipole interaction. So in that way we can completely decouple the interaction phase of the gate from the propagation phase. So we come in, store photons, they're non-interacting at that stage, and then we impose an interaction by inducing a resonant dipole-dipole interaction, which we're going to create with a microwave field. And then that goes off again, and then we read out these non-interacting photons with this nicely imposed um, <coughs> pi phase shift, conditional pi phase shift. So here's our usual blockade. So I can put in two excitations as long as they're separated by the blockade sphere. So, so I'm going to put these two channels to be separated by the blockade sphere initially. And this blockade radius, we're going to call the optical blockade radius, and it goes as the C6 over h bar omega, where omega is essentially the line width of this excitation, so the power broadened line width of the... Um, so that gives me some length scale. So I want to separate my two photon channels by more than this optical blockade radius initially, so that I can put in two Rydberg excitations into my system. And then I want to make these things interact. And I can do this, so this is the picture we showed last time, and I'm essentially borrowing this idea now from optical dipole-dipole interactions, these resonant dipole-dipole interactions, but I'm going to do it in the microwave domain, and we saw this a bit when I talked about hopping last time. But if I apply a microwave field now, so I've created two Rydberg excitation, say, in the S state, so I've got an NS and an NS, and now I apply this microwave field and I get resonant dipole-dipole interactions, and they've got this 1 over R cubed length scale, and it's longer, so 1 over R cubed doesn't drop off as quickly as 1 over R to the 6, so I get, I get longer range interactions with this, and effectively I get a bigger blockade sphere, so I can write down a new blockade radius, which is the microwave blockade radius, which is C3 over H bar omega mu, and this is the microwave broadened line width, and it's one third, not one sixth. And this can be much larger, so it can be about a factor of three larger than this optical blockade radius. So I might have an optical blockade of five microns, and this guy's 15 <coughs> microns, or an optical blockade of 10, this guy's 30 microns. So this gives me the option of, of going in and writing things that don't interact, spin waves that don't interact, and then inducing an interaction via this microwave driving, and that's what we want, want to do. So that's sort of sketched here on this graph that I got two photons come in, they go into my medium, and I couple them to Rydberg states, and so I create Rydberg polaritons. So there's a polariton here, there's a polariton here, and this is the optical blockade radius we're given by this blue arrow, given by C6 over the optical Rabi frequency to the 1, 6. And so I put my two that are separated by more than this optical blockade radius, so I can have these two Rydberg excitations side by side here. 
And then we're going to apply a microwave field. It's a resonant microwave field, like the stuff that Tom Gallagher talked about, and I guess Frederick's talked a lot about microwave and millimeter wave spectroscopy, and induce bigger dipole dipole interactions with a 1 over r cubed. So I get this microwave interaction that's got this larger blockade radius, and it's this big circle here. So now both of these guys are within this larger blockade radius, and so I've got a spatially independent blockade effect now between these two guys. And that way I can impose a global phase shift on this photon if this one is here. So that's how we can do a global C phase gate. So it's, it's not trivial, but this is a way we can at least do it if we really want to do it. So it's nice to have a scheme that actually really works for this. Um, okay, so let's go back and see where we are with the experiment. So, so where we are with the experiment is we like these things to be side by side, and that's the experiment that Hannes is building at the moment, um, and you saw on his poster downstairs. And our old experiment, they're not side by side, but they're end to end, and we don't have exactly two, we, um, because our cloud's a little bit too long, we have three. But we can at least investigate what happens with these, when we apply these microwave fields, and if, so if we have these three blockade spheres now, they're clearly separated by a blockade radius, and if that, what I've just told you is true, then when we apply the microwave field, we create these larger blockade spheres, and we should see an effect of the interaction <coughs> now between the, the spin wave in this guy and the spin wave in this guy, so to speak. So this is the experiment that we do. So this looks like a stored light experiment or Rydberg quantum memory experiment, where we come in um, following this sort of dark state polariton uh, protocol that we have a pulse of signal, signal light here, so it comes on over here and goes off. This is the red one. And then the control light goes off first, um, and then that stores, that locks in this excitation. So now all the light's converted into Rydberg excitation, so then the light goes off. And so now we've got this excitation in a Rydberg state, which is 60, 60s, say. And then we apply a microwave field in the Rydberg manifold between, in our case, 60s and 59p. So this is we're going to drive Rabi oscillations on this transition here. And then we read out the pulse. So we have a store, process, retrieve sequence. And the idea is to use <coughs> this in, in multiple channels then to do global um, um, phase shifts on photons, conditional phase shift, and make one of these C phase gates. So let's look at uh, some effects in our imperfect system at the moment where we have these end-to-end -end blockade spheres and see, can we see an effect of the microwave? So what I showed you last time was, a, um, was this sort of hopping model um, where we saw the effect of Rabi oscillations. So, so this is our, here we're measuring the amplitude of this pulse. So we just integrate the amount of light that's in our retrieved pulse and, and call, um, and if we have no microwaves that we call that one. That's how many photons we get um, when there's no microwave. So that's, that's our normalized signal. So no microwave field, we get this amount of light. And then we apply the microwave field and we vary the intensity of the microwaves. We don't vary the time, but essentially we vary the... So we're varying the, the, the number of oscillations we do in the block sphere by varying the intensity. So we're going faster and faster around the block sphere, but the time we have to do this is fixed. So we drive Rabi oscillations, and we lose signal. And this is due to dephasing. So there's now spatially dependent dipole-dipole interactions in our system that are sort of bad. And, and mean that we dephase, so we lose signal, but then we recover some signal. So this looks like Rabi oscillations here. But then we can see what happens to the photon statistics. So we have one of these Hambry bound twist photon correlators, and when we start, we start with a G2 of about 0.6, something like that. And that's about consistent with the fact that we've got three photons, so it's a um, it's, it, it's, an, it's a truncated coherent state. So we're not in the regime where we store one photon, we store more than one photon. So we don't expect G2 to be zero because we've got, we've got more than one photon. But we're also, it's not a coherent state because we've truncated the number of photons that we can store. We can't store more than three, so we cut off our coherent state and that already modifies the G2. So this is consistent with what we'd expect for, for the, number of the limit of the number of photons we can store in our medium, so it's a sort of squeeze state, number squeeze state, if you like. And then we add, so this is before the microwaves, at that point here, the blue point, and then we look on this recovery, and when we've done a, a Rabi oscillation, we've recovered some signal, and what we see is we see less, uh, um, we see a suppression of G2, so it's become more single photon-like. So what's happened is that with this resonant dipole-dipole interaction by the microwave field, we've induced 
additional interactions that weren't there before. And what it's done is it's kicked out more photons. So whenever, the, whenever the, these spin waves are, are localized, one gets kicked out because now I've got this resonant dipole-dipole interaction and I've got two guys within a block sphere. So within this microwave block sphere, one guy gets dephased and gets kicked out in another direction. So this is sort of a dissipative bad version of a gate. So, but it's, what the point I want to make is that we can show at least at this stage that we can control the photon-photon interactions with the microwave field. So what we have to do next is, and what Hannes is doing, is to put these in a more controlled way side by side and control this interaction, control all the phases, not lose the photons, get out and recover nice photons with a nice phase shift. And so that's the next step. But this is a sort of first step towards doing this controlled phase operation on single photons. All right, so, so that's, uh, this is a sort of, this paper that's just about to appear, it's on the archive at the moment, explains the whole scheme of uh, how you do this controlled phase gate. So that's the sort of experimental set. And I, I should say that I don't think that this is unique, so I, I hope that maybe some of you are inspired to come up with a better scheme, because um, it's all right, but it'd be nice if it was a simpler way of doing it. Um, so maybe you can, uh, in, if you go back and you can write to me and say, oh, I've got a much better way of doing it, I'll be very happy. All right, so that brings me pretty much to the end. I hope um, that's about on time. So I just want to summarize, and I have focused a bit on experiments we've done um, so that you can see what, what the kind of stuff we do in Durham, but obviously it ties into the wider field. And I think, I, I think there's, there's two interesting aspects of this whole business, which is um, one aspect that I've talked about a bit that I don't think anyone else talked about is this idea of the dipolar mean field. So I've got, this, this, if you like, a probe dipole that interacts with the bath of all the other dipoles. And you get some very interesting physics in this system. I've talked about the optical dipole, dipole case where we had the Lorentz shift, the cooperative Lamb shift in these fin slabs with optical dipoles. And then if we think about that, the Lorentz shift becoming excitation dependent, then we get these phase transitions, optical bistability, and, and interesting things going on in the Rydberg case. And then in the more pure, so this is in the more pure dipole-dipole, so the pairwise dipole-dipole, where we have many orders of the interaction, we don't truncate it in a mean field way, so we consider all, all orders of the dipole-dipole interaction. Then we get all this coherent physics, and I talked about hopping a little bit, um, which we, in the last lecture, and then today I talked about doing photon-photon interactions as well. So that's where I will finish.